Hi, and welcome to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. My name's Jason Van Shee, and I'm one of the hosts of the show. The aim of this podcast is to rapidly increase the knowledge and application of psychological health and safety in workplaces worldwide. To help with this, we'll have regular guests from around the world who are leading the way in this important area. Before I introduce you to our guest and topic for the day, allow me to introduce my co-host, Joelle Mitchell. How are you, Joelle? I'm doing all right today, Jason. How are you going? Yeah, good. Uh, day two of uh, a five-day lockdown in Perth. Uh, how are five you days, adjusting? hopefully. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. How are you adjusting? Uh, it's not, not too bad. Um, my husband's home so he can entertain my son during the day, so that takes uh, some of the challenge away from me being a parent trying to work at home, um, and they've got uh, multiple entertainment devices that they're taking advantage of. Um, my yep. son's quite pleased to have the extra week of school holidays. So, um, yeah, for the most part, I can leave them to it. So I'm probably in a more fortunate position than a lot of those, um, those working parents in that I've got someone at home who can take on a lot of that. Yeah, and similarly with my wife being able to look after our three rugrats. Um, so it's interesting that, you know, we're having this very short lockdown. The guest that we're going to have on today has been in a, in a lockdown for a while and it's commonplace, I guess, in most places around the world. Um, but obviously that's just creating additional pressure and, and stress on top of uh, everything else that's, that's going on in the world. Yep, it's just, it, it's bringing, I think, the mental health um, situation a greater prominence probably than it's had before. Um, so I suppose we can see that maybe as a, a little bit of a silver lining um, in that the, you know, the pandemic has really, on the one hand, created a lot of um, mental health problems, but on the other hand, also really highlighted the significance of mental health, um, certainly in the workplace and, and more widely. Um, and hopefully, you know, what we're seeing in Australia is a greater government response to, um, to you know, funding mental health initiatives and to doing more planning and, and more proactive work in the, in the workplace mental health space in particular. Um, and so I think from, from that perspective, um, you know, we're, we're seeing some traction finally in this area that we've really been trying to push for, for a long time. Yeah, totally. Uh, of course, the, the pandemic has been hugely disruptive. Um, we're very, again, fortunate to be in Australia and, and it's fairly in hand here. Um, but uh, if anything, I've, I really feel that it has brought forward our agenda in terms of workplace mental health, at least probably three to five years in terms of the focus that it's been able to put on it. Mm. Yeah. So uh, if you're tuning in on the video on YouTube, you'll notice that I'm still recording from my son's bedroom. They're not my medals behind me. They're uh, my son's. Uh, please, uh, yeah, if you're interested, do check out the video. Uh, otherwise, we will be sharing short clips of today's uh, podcast on LinkedIn as well. But what I'd like to do now is to introduce our guest for today. Uh, and she's the ideal person to talk to regarding today's topic of the Canadian perspective on psychological health and safety. Uh, she's been driving change in Canada at a national level for much of the last decade, and she's currently serving as Director of Prevention and Promotion Initiatives at the Mental Health Commission of Canada. Welcome to the podcast, Sapna Mahajan. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. I am sad that you guys are in a sudden lockdown, but we've been in it for so long that uh, it seems like the new normal for us here. Yeah, um, like I said, we're uh, definitely getting the easier end of the stick here in, in Australia and in, and in Perth. So uh, we're definitely not going to complain given <laughs> the international audience that this is going out to. No, and we absolutely have, and, not complaining. Yeah. And we have negative, I think, 30 weather here today. So it's, it's oh. cold too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, we, we have very warm temperatures at the moment, but uh, pity we can't really go to the beach. But again, we're not going to complain. We're getting it a lot better than, than many other places in the world. So. All right. So, um, Sapna, something that we've been doing as a, as a little bit of a warm-up is to talk with our guests about their favourite podcast. Um, so I haven't had a chance to, to share mine yet, and I think um, probably a few of them are in common with a lot of our other guests, like the um, Safety of Work podcast, um, you know, you can't go past revisionist history really with, with Malcolm Gladwell. Um, some of the other ones that I like is um, Work Life with Adam Grant. Um, just being an organisational psychologist, um, he 
brings some quite useful insights, I think, and that's, a, that's quite a good listen. Um, cautionary tales I've been enjoying. Um, I think just because I'm a little bit of a, um, a, a nerd when it comes to sort of understanding about, um, you know, how, how catastrophic events unfold and just the, the nuances of, of what goes into that. Um, and I think that he, he explores those quite well. So I do enjoy those. And um, one that I quite enjoyed was uh, Deep Cover, which was this um, sort of story about um, an FBI agent who, who went undercover um, to, yeah, basically uncover this big um, sort of drug dealing um, ring, I suppose. I'm not, I'm not being very eloquent in, in describing it, but <laughs> it, was, um, it, was, it was very well done. So um, that, that's a good listen as well. Um, so, yeah, a little bit of, um, of variety there in the types of things that I listen to. What about you, Satna? Well, I've just started getting into podcasts slowly. So this is new. It's nice to hear what you were listening to. I've heard of Work Life. I love the cautionary tales. I'm going to look into that. I've heard a few from Broken Brain. And I've, I've been listening to um, Smartless, which is just a few celebrities who interview people. And they started with celebrities, but now they've been getting politicians and advocates. And it's one thing I'm really enjoying about podcasts is, I guess you could say the informality, but how you dig deeper into topics, whether it's celebrities, politicians, or the way they share stories. I heard Serial, and I loved it. Um, the thrillers through a podcast. And so I'm just getting into it, and I'm realizing what a big world it is. And um, I think, it, for me, it's been a bit of a rabbit hole. I don't know where to start. There's so much, and I go really deep. So I think I need to just start with a couple, and I like that cautionary tale. So I think I'll start with that and see how it goes. Good. Yeah, it, it, is a, it is a good one. I, I very much enjoy it. Um, all right. So that's a little bit of, of uh, getting to know you personally. Can you tell us a little bit about your professional career so far? Yeah, my background is mostly in public health um, and have always my past was in international work. I worked at the Clinton Foundation. But when I came back to Canada, I worked overseas. I worked in I got into mental health. So my focus has really been, as you said, Jason, mental health in the workplace. And it's really around the role that workplaces can play to expand their notion of health and safety to include mental health as well as physical health. And for the last couple of years, I've actually been working for the government of Canada, taking our standard, which I think we'll talk about later, but really a framework on how to look at mental health in the workplace and implement it uh, in more than 90 departments in, in the biggest kind of employer in Canada and really drive uptake across the country and the world just around this kind of concept. So my work has really largely been focusing um, around that, but from different perspectives, writing the framework and the policy, doing research to make sure it actually works, and then actually implementing it, you know, in, in the head of HR kind of role among many small, medium and large uh, enterprises. Fantastic. Um Sorry, Jason, do you want to? Yeah, um, so you, you work with the Mental Health Commission, but you have a, another role as well, do you? Um, for two years, we call it in Canada an interchange. Uh, uh, the government of Canada kind of borrowed me <laughs> from the Mental Health Commission of Canada, which is our national kind of policy body for mental health. The government kind of bored me for a couple of years because they wanted a very specific expertise on how to really advance mental health in the workplace. So I was heading up a center of expertise on mental health in the workplace for the government. And then I have about 20 other hats that I won't get into sitting on with the World Health Organization or the Asia Pacific Economic Co-op or ISO. I think you had a guest a couple of days ago with Peter Kelly and you're having Carlos. We all sit together on this international committee as well. So I have lots of hats um, in different ways, but they all connect to mental health in the workplace. Yeah, terrific. Uh, sounds like, yeah, you're having that uh, massive impact, not just locally in Canada, but uh, internationally through some of the other hats that you wear as well. It's fantastic. 
Um, so tell us about the state then of, of workplace mental health in Canada. Um, is it going well? Is it trending up? Is it trending down? I think in one way, I often hear the phrase, you know, Canada had this accelerated movement for mental health in the workplace. And it's true, you know, more than 10 years ago, there was a real acceleration, not only in the laws, but things that Canadians did. And I won't go into too many details, but businesses, people really started to see the role of workplaces and mental health. But I would still say we are far from where we we need to be. Stigma is still very pervasive. Um, it's still alive in our workplaces. And, you know, I think of physical health and safety, it took 100 years to really change the way people thought about health and safety, traditional health and safety. And so even with psych health and safety, we're at the beginning. I would say we are ahead from, you know, if you look at the whole world, yes, we're ahead in certain aspects, but we have a long way to go. And the more and more I work with other countries, I realize there's lots to learn from all countries, different pieces. But I would say the piece around stigma and really that systemic change, um, it, it, we, we still have some ways to go. So what are some of the key statistics then in, in Canada around um, you know, workplace stress or psychological injuries? Um, I would say it's actually pretty similar when I look all around the world at the stats, but in Canada, um, we have a population around 30 some million people and about 500,000 people are absent from work each week due to mental illness. This is a different 500,000 each week. And these are just the people who've admitted that they're off because of a mental health issue. It doesn't count students. So it's huge. Um, in most places in Canada, 30% of disability claims are attributed to mental illness, but it, 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 it accounts for 70% of costs. And so it's huge. It, it comes to about $51 billion a year for the economy. So, and most, or now we know it just was published for the government of Canada that 50%, it's actually 51% of all its disability claims. So largest employer of Canada is due to mental illness. So it's, it's huge and it's going up. And this pandemic, unfortunately, has shown a light on that you know, the cracks in the system, you're really seeing and, and, you know, I often say that, and we've seen this in data that the pandemic will end. But the long lasting impact on people's mental health will outlast the pandemic. And it's kind of a silent, it's a silent echo pandemic that's happening. And I wouldn't even say it's so silent anymore. Um, but we're seeing that to be a huge impact. And in countries like ours that are so cold and so isolated during these months right now, you're really seeing um, the impact more uh, and more. So the stats are getting, to go back to your stats piece, they're collecting data as much as they can, but we're seeing some of the, these spikes right now um, even more uh, than before. Yeah, and that totally makes sense. We know that any psychosocial hazard on its own can cause stress and people were already stressed before the pandemic uh, and then throw another massive stressor on on the pile and obviously we're, we're expecting this peak and like you say this echo pandemic of, of mental illness and i think just to say that it's not even the hazards it's that nobody has their protective factors you know we're all usually have all these protective factors of being with family and friends exercise uh, working out um, the distance from home for many people is actually a protective factor. Being away from your children as someone with three kids who've had them home for a long time, that is, that's how we stay healthy, right? And um, I think it's having these increased hazards, but it's also people lacking their protective factors. So people aren't able to cope uh, as they did before. Yeah, absolutely. So much greater demands and less support. So the, the worst of both worlds. So yeah, absolutely. So um, that probably dovetails nicely then into the development of the national standard. So tell us, tell us first of all, um, you know, what is the standard and why was it created? Yeah, so about 10 years, a little more ago, um, People in the mental health field, like myself, were knocking on doors, just begging organizations to hear us out. Mental health is important. Mental health is important. And most organizations looked at us and said, mental health is something that you get over there in a hospital. Don't talk to us. And then they started seeing the numbers increase. And they started looking at their costs and their absenteeism and their sick leave. And they thought, 
this is starting to be a bit of an issue that we actually care. It's, it's affecting our bottom line or our retention. And so we brought together CEOs. We brought together the HR and the OSH, labor, all the relevant stakeholders. And we said, what are we going to do? We know there's a big issue. And it was actually that group of people who said, we need some kind of national standard, not written by mental health people. Even though I'm one of those folks who work at a national organization, we don't want a health organization or one that's viewed. We want a Canadian Standard Association to write this like any workplace standard. We want it to have the credibility, um, the respect of legitimately, but also be written by the business, by the unions, by labor, and of course have mental health experts there. Um, it wasn't devaluing the leadership and the role and the expertise of the mental health community. It was about if a workplace wants to take on a framework, it really should be written like other health and safety standards. And so we raised money as a commission, um, our government of Canada and others funded it, and we got the Canadian Standard Association to develop it just like they do for any other standard. And we made it free uh, of charge for five years to start. And as soon as it was launched, we had the biggest companies, the smallest organization, unions, you know, our Chamber of Commerce, our Minister of Labor, all on stage at once saying, this is not uh, a partisan issue. This is not something about mental health and mental illness. This is about how do you keep people in your workplace? And it's about your health and safety responsibilities at a workplace. So this is not about um, making sure you know, what do people have in being a psychiatrist? This is about and not turning workplaces into healthcare organizations. Just like if someone's broken their leg, it's about how do they get the care they need or to come to work? And how do we prevent uh, foreseeable injuries in the workplace? And I think because it was done like that, that was the impetus and the development. It was well received. It had the respect, but it also went through um, quite a bit of rigor in a way that any other standard um, goes through and still goes through that. So I think that's why it may have had such a positive outcome, not only in its value, like how good it is, but why the organizations actually took it up, um, opposed to other kinds of guidelines mental health organizations um, have put out. Okay. I think that's a... Oh, sorry, Joel. Have you, have you got any statistics on um, the uptake then of, of the standard? Because what we're seeing, you know, in other parts of the world, whether it's UK or Australia, who are also kind of like up there, uh, probably I'd still put Canada maybe above us uh, in terms of, <laughs> of how you guys are doing this. Um, but, you know, it is quite political and you do have sections who are hesitant, I guess, to adopt something uh, like a standard. Well, I think just to say there was also a lot of hesitation when we put it out. And um, one, we made it that it wasn't legal or mandatory, though it is creating a legal obligations in the legal field, which I won't get into, but it, it is not something that was supposed to, it's, it's, it's a voluntary standard. Um, but uh, I think, what was your question again? Sorry, I totally had all these other ideas from the end of your question. Yeah, no, um, there's, it's quite political, right? And you have different people um, fearful of, I guess, yep. making the change and what that's going to mean for them, either a, a, you know, as an employer group or a union group or an employee group. Yeah, so uh, sorry, uh, to say, yes, we had the same, I would call it resistance and also a fear. When you hear the word standard, um, I understand and actually respect greatly that kind of fear, especially for a new field like psych health and safety. So actually, when our standard came out, um, the day it came out, we had a roundtable with big organizations. And within about a month or two, we launched a case study project where we followed 40 organizations in the country, three to four person organizations, all the way to the largest employers. And we had private companies, small, medium, large, unionized, non-unionized. And we followed them for three years as they used the standard. And we looked at how it works. And then hundreds and hundreds of more organizations have slowly come on board. It's taken time. It's also taken significant strategic communications around this being a voluntary framework and a guidance document and trying to 
say, we try not to say implement the standard. We talk about aligning with the standard because these small things do cause fears. But what we gathered in that research from 40 organizations was that it reduced sick time. In hospitals, it actually reduced patient error, increased patient safety. Um, in private companies, we saw a huge reduction in sick leave, reduction in absenteeism, retention. And so as organizations, we started collecting this data and organizations started doing this in their fields, it brought on more organizations. So it was a bit of a movement. So I understand the resistance completely. I also think coming from a standard organization and it being voluntary, um, it did create a little bit more of that kind of credibility and understanding that it aligned with health and safety standards already. And really what people are afraid of is that it's going to make workplaces do something they're not supposed to do. They're not healthcare organizations. Because it was written like a health and safety standard, it's really written with what is the workplace factors that only a workplace can control. So it's based on 13 psychosocial factors that only a workplace can control. Workplace demands, civility and respect. Um, this is only the factors that organizations can really look at. And also it talks about dual responsibility, a joint responsibility between employees and employers. This is not all employer. So I think there are some really key aspects in the standard um, that I think have slowly brought on organizations. But it is slow and we have a huge amount of organizations to still get on board here. Yeah, I, I like how you say um, you're really focusing on the hazards that are really in the employer's control. Um, because uh, when I talk about mental health at work, uh, a lot of companies go, well, if someone's got an illness or someone's stressed at home, that's not our responsibility. They're bringing that into work. Um, but obviously, there are hazards that are completely the responsibility of, of the employer. And those are the ones that they need to focus on, not the things that they can't. Exactly. Now, I, I use the broken leg just example that, of course, somebody could break their leg at home, nothing to do with work. But I bet you your workplace needs to find out how to accommodate them in a wheelchair or crutches so that they can continue working. And your workplace needs to make sure there's no hole in the ground that they would break their leg in the first place. So it's all about preventing foreseeable injury and then promoting well-being. And for those who are sick, for whatever reason, there's a way to bring them back in the workplace, keep them productive. Yeah, I um, we, we use very similar analogies actually in episode one. Okay. Hopefully you you <laughs> picked that up. It just came out yesterday. So uh, hopefully uh, you can have a listen to that and you'll see we're definitely speaking the same language. I also like what if you're saying. If that was with Peter, I would like to say he just copied me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just Joel and myself and maybe we did. Okay. Maybe, maybe that's where we got the uh, awesome uh, ideas from. Um, but look, the other thing that really appealed to what, or to me from what you're saying is the statistics. Um, companies want to see there's evidence behind this. It's not just something that we're going to force you to do uh, with no credibility, no case studies, nothing like that. Uh, we're actually working through something similar with Monash University researchers over in Victoria. We're deploying our software product Flourish DX to 3,600 teachers over a 18 month period uh, in a randomized control study. So we really feel it is important to, if you're going to do something new, like a systemic approach versus an individual approach to uh, employee mental health, um, that you really need to provide evidence. And, and we find working in education that, you know, they are, yes, they're a very at-risk cohort for psychosocial hazards, um, but they're also the ones that probably require the, the largest amount of evidence uh, before they actually make a change. Yeah, and the four sectors that used our standard the most in Canada, you were saying if we collect data around the use, and um, it's education, government, so public sector, health sector, and first responder. And Canada just released the first in the world standard for post-secondary education about a month ago. And it's because there's also this unique relationship around the employees, so teachers and professors, but also the students. Um, and if they're not well and healthy, students are the future and that important link between uh, the two. And just to say the Canadian Standard Association has put out hundreds of standards. Um, I had no idea, but they even have a standard on lead pencils and how big lead should be in a pencil. But this standard is the number one used standard downloaded of all, of all their standards out of hundreds of standards. 
Um, so it, there, it's huge. I think it's been uniquely downloaded because you have to you have to sign up for it. Probably, I think it, we're at now sixty five thousand. Wow. So and all around the world. Um, so yes. Yeah. Well, Joel and I definitely account for two of those uh, downloads between the two of us. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But uh, yeah, no, we've definitely seen in Australia, even though we have our own standards, um, as we were mentioning before the show to you, uh, there's a lot that actually are adopting the National Standard of Canada uh, because it is so well received and there's really great evidence behind its efficacy. Yep. And I think it can be used for any organization. It's more of a framework on how to set up a system versus do ABC. Because I think in Australia and every organization has its unique realities, its unique resources and structure. And the standard offers a more broader, it's more about the approach you take given your own unique, you know, realities. Yeah, I've definitely observed that myself. There's, whilst there's a lot of, um, you know, standards and guidelines out there that have, you know, this is what you should do. You should do risk management or, you know, this is how you might consult with staff. Uh, none of them really put it in a logical order. Start here. So obviously getting leadership commitment, getting policy and yeah. in your governance kind of strategies, you, you need to do that first to get everything to hang off. But if you just read any policy, it's like, oh, yeah, we'll just do a risk assessment. And then we're done, right? That's that's it. And so many companies, like if you if you think about employee engagement surveys, um, you know, HSC sometimes will use that data as to form part of their risk assessment, but they're not actually doing any other part of the risk management process. Yeah. Or what we've seen a lot of is they just do one training as a silver bullet, uh, and they don't see a difference. And it's because you actually have to look at what hazards are really affecting your workplace and actually put things in place that are systemic, that are integrated. I say from recruitment to retirement, embed it throughout. This isn't a shiny object right now, right? It isn't a separate siloed stream. This should be integrated in everything that you do from recruiting staff all the way to retirement. And that's the way to really see that long-term systemic uh, change. So, Satna, you've talked about some of the um, outcomes that individual organisations have reported through. Do you have details at a sort of national level? Have any of the stats shifted um, since there's been this uptake of the standards? Um, I don't know if we have so much, but we are seeing trends. Uh, things like organisations who are using the standard, we're seeing um, increased EAP usage as one example, which has been great. And that actually shows that people are seeking care earlier and reducing their short-term disability. So we're seeing in groups of organisations that have been using the standard, we have seen common indicators like increased EAP, reduction in short-term and long-term disability. We've seen more return to work uh, when people are off to leave or return to work earlier, which is huge because I think, I don't know exactly the stats, but it's something like if people are off for three months, there's a 50% chance they're back. Once they hit six months, it goes down to 20%. So the longer people are away, the less likely they are to return to work. So getting people back to work earlier and to stay in work is, is really important. So just to say that organizations who are using standards, we're seeing some really positive outcomes that seem to be reoccurring and revalidating and common among all of them. Funny enough, when the pandemic hit, we saw that organizations who were using the standard, because there's actually a critical response section. So organizations who had already started integrating some of these pieces already had leadership support, especially the sustained leadership commitment. People who are already collecting data on the factors, when this pandemic hit, they had the data, they knew what their weak points were, and they were able to continually collect and see where the issues are, what do we need to put into place, but also staff felt like maybe it was a safer place to come forward if they were struggling. They'd already started tackling some of the stigma. Um, managers, I, I find honestly the most critical piece other than leadership and is middle management. It is the people leaders. And um, I find that organizations who had trained them uh, where people leaders actually had the competencies when they were hiring them or retraining them. It's that when things like the pandemic hit, these were real people leaders. They actually knew how to manage people in situations. They knew how to have difficult conversations and they, it was just, 
easier and better to cope during the time. As an organization, they were more resilient. So I, I would say we haven't collected any comprehensive data, but we're the organizations that were doing that, we're seeing some common outcomes and maybe a bit more strength and resilience through uh, the pandemic. I think the, um, the numbers that you provided there on the um, sort of returning to work sooner are, are really promising. Um, and I think that the, um, you know, return to work processes in particular are, are critical when you're talking about, um, you know, mental health absences, because a lot of the time, you know, people are just returned into that same workplace that was presenting them with the hazard in the first place. The hazard is still there. They're just going to relapse. So there's a lot, it's not just the standard return to work process like you would use for an injury. Um, it really it involves a lot of that, um, that hazard identification and, and making those, um, those changes in the workplace. And, and I have to say, it, it's a new field and a lot of organizations say they want to do this. And then they tell somebody who's really busy in OSH or HR and say, do something about psych health and safety. And they're not trained to have the competencies. And so I think it's the organizations that have succeeded, if they're large enough to have HR or OSH or a certain person, is actually giving people the training and the space to learn about this and do it properly. Because I know people who genuinely want to do the right thing, but this is a whole new field for them. And it's something they're doing on the side of their desk, something they're trying to learn. And, and it's, it's hard. Um, and so I have to give kind of, sympathy to a lot of people who are overworked trying to do this the best they can um, and it's challenging and, and one thing I forgot to say is the organizations who really were already thinking about psych health and safety it was amazing to watch different guidelines come out through the pandemic in Canada but around the world and the first big guideline that came out in Canada especially from our government was physical health and safety you know in March maybe April um, you know, work from home, don't come in. And then they put out a new guideline in, in about August. And it was about maintaining the physical and psychological health and safety of employees during a pandemic and as they reopen workplaces. And they, it really, under each person in the workplace, it talked about the psychological and physical kind of duties of the employees as well as the workplace. And so organizations who are already talking and thinking about that psychological and safety, it was just so well integrated, um, you know, into, into the, these times. I yeah, think that's fantastic. Um, and it's well, such sorry, an important um, thing that, that we've got sort of government um, bodies providing that, that really sound um, evidence-based position because, um, you know, what I've noticed is that there are a lot of, um, people promoting practices and processes that um, probably aren't very evidence-based, I would say. Um, you know, times like these, people, you know, make opportunities where they think they're opportunities. And unfortunately, a lot of those people are coming from a position where they're not very well informed and don't maybe have access to the right information, um, the right evidence to support what they're saying. But, you know, if they've got a flashy product, if they've got a, um, you know, a strong following, then you'll see people uptaking these practices that just don't have the, the evidence to support them and, in fact, can be harmful. Um, so I think that it's really important that governments do proactively step in and provide that robust guidance to workplaces so that they don't get captured by the, uh, the snake oil salespeople, as it were. And I think that's a challenge. It, it, someone said to me, it's like a buffet and I have no idea where to start. And so I just pick a training that looks really nice or I heard someone talk about it or an ad came on my LinkedIn and there's no evidence base. So, but it is a huge challenge. Um, one of the things you were mentioning before Sapna was, you know, these health, poor health and safety professionals are getting burdened uh, from their, uh, their bosses or leadership saying, we really want to do this. Um, on top of everything else that you're doing, put this uh, on as well. And I think that's, again, a um, indication that you don't have leadership support or the level of leadership support that you need, right? Not only does it have to be enshrined in policy and leaders get out and talk about the importance of it, um, but to really have demonstrated support, you need to have resources, you need to have time, you need to have training uh, to do all of these initiatives properly. 
Yep. And it doesn't have to be new resources. I talk about like the shifting of resources, just having a little bit more people and money up front will save you many people and money downstream. So, and I think it's integrating. You don't have to create a new committee. Everyone has health and safety committees, just include psychological in that you already have employee surveys maybe crosswalk them with the 13 psychosocial factors. Um, there's a great free resource called Guiding, Guarding Minds at Work, which is a free survey on the 13 factors. You know, pick some questions from there and use them. So there's lots of ways to integrate it, but somebody needs to provide that kind of training and skills and resources to, to those who are leading this in organizations. Yeah. One of the things that Joel and I have spoken about is creating a free uh, resource particularly and this will dovetail nicely into the next part of the conversation around the ISO 45003 standard given it's a global standard rather than a, a Canadian or UK or an Australian standard uh, we felt it would be really good to have some good free to access content about what is the standard how would you actually adopt this practically in an organization and have that uh, aimed I guess at the people who actually have to implement it as well as the line manager level um, yeah that's great yeah, I mean, I think in Canada, to be honest, we have the standard and a year later we put out an implementation guide, which took each clause of the standard and wrote it in plain language and actually provided, you know, templates and tools. And that's what people actually use in Canada more than the standard. When I actually talk to those at the front lines, they say, I'm using your implementation guide more. And so I think having real tools to help people take action and implement is probably more useful in itself than, than the standard. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and I guess that's why we're doing this psych health and safety podcast, because uh, it's about getting information out there that's free. It's not behind a paywall. It's easily yeah. digestible and it's, it's distributed to where people are. They're on podcasts, they're on LinkedIn, and that's where we'll be having these conversations and sharing this information. That's great. Yeah. So um, I guess, yeah, we, we just mentioned ISO 45003 and Canada obviously played a big part in the development of the draft standard. And we're really uh, anticipating that hopefully by about June, uh, according to Peter Kelly, if uh, <laughs> I know it's gone through a number of different versions. So um, hopefully we see the final thing in the coming months. Yeah, it's gone through a lot. I'm probably not as optimistic as Peter, but I might not know the timeline. I keep telling people early 2022. So um, uh, that might just be my conservative Canada being <laughs> cautious. But uh, no, I think one, it is different than the Canadian standard, but I think it's um, it's the UK and Canada and Australia, but many countries actually taking the lessons learned and probably making a better standard, something that's more applicable, resonates with many others and, and learning from some of the kind of pitfalls we may have made in all our own experiences in our countries. I think it's, um, it, w it has been challenging at certain points just because it's so many countries and people are coming from such different places. But I think what it will do is create this international impetus and movement towards a common understanding and approach to psych health and safety. And it's tied to the international health and safety standard. Um, and so really workplaces can no longer say mental health is not for us or mental health this or that. Um, I think it will give people or equip those champions with a tool to really get um, some attention and movement. Um, so I think it's going to be a good standard. We're in draft right now getting feedback and input. So we'll see where we land. But uh, so far, it seems very promising. There are some very smart people around the table, lots of different perspectives. So I think through all the discussions, only brings them um, a better product. So it's been really interesting getting to sit there for Canada. Well, you're a better person than me. I hate working by committee and uh, with so many experts on that committee, I can imagine the sort of rigorous discussions that you would have had. Yes, and because we can't meet in person, there are weeks where we meet from about 4 a.m. Canada time till 7 a.m. every day of the week for weeks. Yeah. We go clause by clause. So it's been... Um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a great experience, but lots of patience. Yeah, so tell us a bit about um, what you wanted to see in the standard from a Canadian perspective and, and what you've learned from the national standard. 
Um, I think some of the big things is really around identifying the piece around hazards. So really, we've learned number one is data, data, data. You need to collect data around what your actual psychosocial factors are. What are the hazards? And really only focus on the hazards that are key. Um, two, we really believe in Canada, which we've got some opposition on, is consultation, employee engagement. Um, that's really big. Having unions, the center that I was overseeing in the government we co-chair it with the unions. And yes, it's harder at times, but it creates the path, you know, to really for success. So employee engagement, empowerment, you know, all that of the, the employees is big. Um, the piece around stigma is really big for us too. Um, there is huge stigma. And if you don't break down stigma, stigma is the number one reason people don't seek care. And so I really think we really need to change the attitudes and behaviors of those in the workplace. And that needs to have consequences and rewards around it. Um, so those are some of the key kind of pieces we're really hoping to see. And for it to be a framework on how people need to kind of go about really looking at what are the hazards and what to put into place. We've been big proponents of having an annex or an implementation guide to kind of attach with a standard because we really believe a standard alone will probably give people a little bit but will not be enough to really give the tools and equip many of the countries who are new in this to take action. So we've been pushing that. And another one obviously is things like leadership commitment, um, you know, a lot of the pieces around our Canadian standard, um, we've been kind of trying to get into this uh, international one. Yeah, that consultation piece, I think, is so important and often um, not done as well as it could be. Uh, again, if we take the employee engagement survey kind of as an example, often there'll be a survey done and then uh, the HR, HSE people will go, oh, we've got all the information that we need. All right, yeah. now we're going to make change. This is our action plan. Yeah. Um, I um, was involved actually with the survey that we run through our platform with a, um, a local uh, insurance company. Uh, and we we're doing a specific focus on training consultants. And through the survey, it was identified that role overload or you know just too much work uh, was one of the issues. Uh, but when we ran a follow-up focus group workshop with the training consultants and said, hey, let's look at the results of the survey and kind of examine why you thought that these were the largest hazards, uh, it turned out it wasn't that role overload was a problem all the time. Uh, it was just that it wasn't uncommon for say, um, someone from the business to come to the training department and say, hey, look, I've got 10 people who need training at 8 a.m. tomorrow. Uh, and then they'd have yep. to kind of drop everything and be expected to service the business with that training requirement. So um, through understanding the hazard through further consultation, rather than just taking the direct quantitative survey result, we we're really able to get to the heart of it, which then led to us coming up with uh, a really great way to address that hazard uh, through, again, through that focus group. Um, they said, hey, if we can come up with a service level agreement with the business that says, um, yes, we'll do training for you, but you need to give us five business days notice, yeah. then that is actually an example of eliminating that hazard. Um, not eliminating role overload altogether, but eliminating that particular hazard. So, um, yeah, I, I think consultation is so key, but often we just take the easy route, take the survey data and go, we've got the information, we know what to do without that further consultation. And I think that's why workplaces don't always see a difference. They say, what? People are still burning out. People are still unhappy. People, well, did you actually really understand the issue? And another thing to say, which shouldn't be surprising, but it seems to be, is that when we're talking about mental health in the workplace, often the solutions have, they're not mental health solutions. They're about training managers. They're about changing your workplace systems. It's about workload balance, about civility and respect. It's about actually having managers who know how to manage people and training those managers and doing proper performance on them. It's about letting go of people who might be ha harassing people. Or So it really, it's not about um, mental health interventions and solutions. When you actually get down to what people's issues are, they're often pretty simple or maybe not simple to fix, but they are quite clear. And when organizations actually address the issues because they're looking at the right data or collecting it right or consulting right, that's when they actually see a difference. 
Yeah, I love that point about it not being, you don't need to understand it from a mental health perspective. Often it's just understanding the hazard and then putting in place a systems level or work group level kind of intervention that tackles the hazard. And it might be a HR um, intervention. It might be a health and safety intervention. Um, but yeah, you really need to get to the heart of the matter. So we're, we're quite um, excited about the first time we're going to have a globally agreed. And I know that's been through a lot of work from people like yourself and having these rigorous discussions to get that global agreement on, you know, what is best practice. So what are some of your, your hopes then with um, things like ISO 45003 coming out in the next, you know, hopefully 12 months? Well, I think there's a lot of things happening at the international level to say. The World Health Organization is writing mental health um, guidelines at work. I sit on that committee. Um, ISO, the Asia Pacific Economic Co-op, just put out a white paper. I co-chair it with Japan, World Bank, World Economic Forum. And I don't know if you know this, but last week, the United for Global Mental Health, there's something called the Business Roundtable, but some of the biggest multinationals in the world, Unilever, and um, have yeah, all yeah, come yeah, together. Yeah, out of that too, yes. Yeah. So just to say that I think ISO is one piece, but a critical piece that is going to really help expedite and accelerate what I'm seeing to be a movement. Unfortunately, the pandemic, I think, has shown a light to workplaces that in order to, for us to survive, um, for us to be productive, to retain staff, for our hospitals, for our healthcare organizations to keep the most critical workers and to keep patients safe, we need to look at mental health in the workplace. And ISO is a tool that will help organizations and countries do that, as well as all this other international work. So I think what I hope is that it is a tool that will benefit organizations and groups but what i really do hope is that the communications and the support around this is clear and good i hope like you said like the canadian standard and maybe in australia like that resistance and the hesitation we as leaders in the field do a good job of communicating it and that it's actually a very useful tool and it's not about creating handcuffs or opening up a pandora's box which i hear both of those all the time but it's about you're, you have an issue that is getting worse, likely in most organizations. I hope this is a tool that will help and support and facilitate the work that you have to do. Make it easier, make it better. And like Joelle said, actually guide you in an evidence-based way into what is the best actions for your organization so that your organization can do what it needs to do, whether it's helping patients build cars, teach students. Hopefully this will just be a tool so that you can be a better organization and what you want to do. So that's my hope. Um, I think it's going to take some time realistically for the uptake, but that's why we as a technical committee are trying to collect stories as soon as it's out. And we're going to hopefully do, you know, webinars and podcasts highlighting organizations all across the world who are using it, how, um, and case studies really is a way um, to do that. So I'm excited as well. And um, happy to keep all of you uh, apprised of how it's going. Okay. All right, Sapna, do you have some parting words of advice for practitioners wanting to create change in this space in the workplace? I mean, I think I would say that it's a journey. Um, it's not about a destination. It's about continual improvement. It is a very hard and um, new area, but it is so worthwhile. It will have the impact, the intended impact that you're hoping for. And the organizations who've been focusing on psych health and safety, who've made this a priority, are seeing true change. Um, they're seeing the impacts, the outcomes. They're seeing healthier staff. They're seeing a greater bottom line. Uh, and it's really making their organization flourish and just to be a better workplace. And, you know, it's funny just to end on a, a funny story is, you know, I've interviewed lots of staff. And in the last few years, because I consider myself young, but clearly I'm not because now I'm interviewing much younger people. And I know when I was interviewing for a job, I would beg them for the job. And when they would ask me, do you have any question? I'd say, no, just I'll take the job whenever, whatever you're going to give me, I'll just take it. Well, now when I interview people and I say, do you have any questions for me? They pull out a book and they say, um, so what's your career development plan? What's your work-life balance? How much do I get professional development? And some people ask, 
is your organization doing anything on mental health? Are you part of this campaign? Do you use the standard? And it shocks me. What kind of supports do you give? What's your, you know, telework policy? And I've realized that the next generation is looking at these things. And so I think for any organization, you know, when we look at the future and the greatest assets, it is not going to be usually our physical labor. It's going to be the brains. And this is the greatest asset for the future. And so I really think, um, you know, as we look to the future and all that future of work, this is such a key aspect along with diversity and inclusion, which is very tied to mental health. And I really think it's the only way. And the question is, are you at the head of the curve or are you going to wait and be at the back? And so um, it, it's a very exciting place to be. And I think you can be the change. There's lots out there on how to do it. And so um, I, I wish anyone doing this work all the best. It's well worthwhile. That's terrific. Um, yeah, like you say, there's just so many opportunities and with the future of work becoming more about knowledge and mental uh, work over physical labor, uh, this is just going to be a growing area. And so there's going to be many, many opportunities for practitioners uh, moving forward. Um, but Sapna, that's been such an engaging and awesome conversation with you. You clearly uh, have been having some uh, massive, uh, making some massive inroads in Canada uh, as well as internationally. Uh, we wish you all the best with with uh, your work and hopefully we'll be able to have you on uh, at another time on, on the podcast in the coming uh, months or years and, uh, you know, find out more about uh, how things are, are tracking over there. That would be wonderful. And hopefully we're all out of lockdowns by then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, touch wood, we're out on Friday, but uh, best of luck as, as you survive the rest of your uh, lockdown and uh, look after yourself. Okay, so, um, thank you so much. Yeah, so uh, that that uh, wraps up today. Thanks so much to the listeners for um, being on. Uh, don't forget, you can also watch this video on YouTube. It drops the same day as the uh, the podcast itself uh, on the Flourish DX channel. Uh, also, uh, Sapna, myself, Joel, we're friendly people. Uh, if you want to continue the conversation uh, online, we're all on LinkedIn. So feel free to either follow us or, or connect with us. Uh, but thanks for listening and have a awesome rest of your day.